So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the former ASEAN Secretary General, Dr. Surin Piswan. Thank you very much, Kun Vinarat, for that brief but sweet introduction. <laughs> uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I can see there are a lot of empty seats after lunch, so I have to keep you awake. That's quite a challenge, I'm sure. But it is always a pleasure to come back to a gathering like this, deliberating on issues that are and will be very, very important to all of us, talking about world trade, global trade, and obstacles to global trade. My other, the other hat that I was wearing, aside from being the Secretary General of ASEAN, was the chief cheerleader of ASEAN. Forever optimistic, forever hopeful. One time I was rushing from the center of Paris to Charles de Gaulle Airport in order to fly on to Singapore for the next day meeting in the morning. But I needed a hair cream, as I always do, I still do, I think. And then I asked the, the driver of the embassy, Thai embassy, to stop at the first pharmacy that you see, because I need a tube of hair cream, desperately. Tomorrow, I have to be well-groomed as ASEAN Secretary General. So I rush into the, the, that pharmacy on the corner of the street just before the guy pulled down his door and locked it. It was eight, nine o'clock in the evening. And he said, I just have one best ever hair cream tube for you. And it's the last one. And you need it. And you will like it. It is the best as far as I know. I use it myself. Well, he was a great salesman. I bought it, and I was paying for that tube. I look up. He was bald. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Mr. Hansen. Nothing to do with nothing personal. But you see... When a salesman wants to sell anything, he would go to the full extent of trying to convince you, even volunteering that I use it myself. I look up, he was bald, how could he use it? <laughs> well, take what I say about ASEAN with a grain of salt. <laughs> and I'm not there anymore, and I'm not wearing that hat, but at least that's what I was doing for five years. Now this afternoon, you would like to hear something about geopolitics as obstacles to global trade. This morning, Dr. Supachai talked to you about the new landscape of global trade and I'm sure you'll be deliberating on issues relevant to global trade. But this afternoon, let me take you on a survey of some of the problems that I have seen, observed, and been concerned about. The first one is this, that a more integrated world, trade is certainly that linkage, 
investment is certainly that linkage. And uh, certainly, transport, communications, logistics have linked us together. But a more integrated world is a more fragile world. We in ASEAN learn about this truth when we were hit by the Asian financial crisis July 10 years ago. July 10 years ago, 1997. It happened here in Bangkok. The next two days, Malaysia ringgits were hit, was hit. The next week, Indonesian rupee. A week after the Philippines pesos, a week, 10 days later, the Korean War. The lesson we learned was that we were more connected than we thought we were. Globalization brought us together. Foreign direct invest investment brought us together. Log logistics and trade certainly have integrated us to each other. The Japanese call their investments in, on our landscape, ASEAN, as a production network. They see it as a platform that could be divided in producing parts and pieces of their final products, whether it's automobile, whether it's electronic goods, whether it's any finished product. So it's a network of production, a production network spread all over the ASEAN landscape. We did not think that anything of that scale could happen to any country. We were also exposed to the global financial market. Many of you still probably remember when you ask a bank or a financial institution for 20 million baht, the bank officer would say, take 100. I have so much. He didn't say anything about kickback. <laughs> didn't say anything about ngun pak mo. That's the Thai phrase. How much these banks and these financial institutions would want back from you? From rather than giving you 10 Take 50, take 100 million. I have a lot of them. Cheap money. We were exposed. We were quite complacent. And we thought the world would be rosy forever. The bubble burst. Burst here and then boom, boom, boom. The domino theory about geopolitics during the Vietnam War that if one fails, Vietnam, the next one would be Cambodia, would be Laos, would be Thailand, would be Malaysia, falling into the socialist, communist camp. That didn't happen. But it happened in 1997 because of our growth, 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 because of the lack of of governance that we have not put together in order to oversee and frame this dynamism growth of 9, 10, 11% a year. All of us. Henry Kissinger made a remark after that soon when he came to visit. I still remember. He said, you were all drunk. But guess who supplied the alcohol? It came from the West. It came from the easy money of the West. You were all drunk with growth, growth, growth. But guess who supplied the alcohol? My part of the world. That's what he said. So a more integrated world is a more fragile world. I think the crisis of 2008, Lemon Brothers in the U.S., 
spilling over to Europe demonstrate demonstrated the same fact, same truth. That because we are more connected than we thought we were, any problem anywhere could drag us down together. And we are still recuperating from that fra fragility of connectivity. The second one is <sighs> Since the Second World War, including the birth of the WTO, of UNCTAD, all these agencies and institutions were put together in order to tame the forces of globalization. Just to make sure that globalization would help lift as many boats as possible, even if not every boat. So we were looking for equity, we were looking for fairness, we were looking for openness, we were looking for leveled playing field. So we invented all these institutions and agencies. But what happened? Multilateralism now is a bad word. It is me first, it is we first, it is one-on-one. -on -one. It is more bilateral when I can squeeze everything out of you rather than having to sit among the 10, the 21 APEC, the larger platform when I have to concede to every one of you and all of you together do not concede as much as I concede. That's the perception. So multilateralism now is a bad word. And that is a threat to a region like ours or to East Asia, the entire landscape for that matter, or to any region anywhere in the world because multilateralism is being undermined because in any negotiation concessions must be made reciprocal treatment must be practiced you can't have it your way 100% but none on the other side can also have it 100% as they wish. That's how multilateralism has served us since the end of World War II, including the World Bank, including the IMF, including the UN system. Now we have to retreat and try to understand and try to read the sign of what are we going to do with this trend of unilateralism, with this trend of my country first. All of you are cheaters because you benefit from globalization. And somehow in the beginning, we benefited too, but now you benefited more than us, therefore, we have to change the rule of the game. This is something that I think we have to deliberate on, something that Angtad will have to deliberate on, something that WTO will have to deliberate on and bring the world back to multilateralism. The third observation is globalization is a two-way traffic. You still remember the time when G7 got together, there would be demonstrations. By whom? By people from the third world, by people from the developing world, fearing that the force of globalization will dominate all of them, every one of them, and won't have anything left for their own people. The former 
Director, Gen former um, um, uh, Consul General of Thailand in Vancouver is here. I don't know if you were there in the year 1998 when the World Bank and IMF was there. When EPEC was there, there were demonstrations on the streets of Vancouver. You remember, remember Genoa, Italy. You remember London when G7 met. Consistently, people from the third world, from the developing world, from our part of the world, were demonstrating. Or civil society from, or friends of. If they are not from our part of the world, they are friends, they are sympathizers who don't like to see globalization going full force for suspicion of that negative impact that it could have on all of us. Well, we have learned to tame the forces of globalization. We have benefited from the forces of globalization. We have lifted a lot of people under poverty line in our countries up above poverty line. We have created a lot of people in the middle class and the rising income of the middle class are matching with the middle class in the West, in Europe and in the US. A sense of insecurity now not coming from the developing part of the world. I call it a blowback of globalization. I call it a reverse form of globalization. It is the people who have lost jobs, who have lost quality of life, who have lost their relative income as Middle East, as, as middle income, and growing. They have lost that prospect. All of a sudden, they feel insecure. All of a sudden, immigrants are coming over. All of a sudden, form Foreigners are taking over jobs. All of a sudden, tremendous import coming in. All of a sudden, we are losing the trade balance and the balance of payments consistently bigger every year. What happened? Brexit. What happened? The triumph of Trump. The negative attitude and perception to the forces of globalization that have somehow helped people around the world are now being looked at as negative, destructive, undermining the wealth and the quality of life of people in the place that already, at that in the beginning, originated the forces of globalization, technology, cheap transport, foreign investments and in the end cheap products meaning jobs exported outside meaning investment being made outside meaning people in the west also enjoy cheaper products of equal quality if not better because produce according to the spec with the technology of those mother companies in those countries anyway. So globalization has become a bad word and globalization has become a phenomenon that had to be changed, had to be stopped, had to be tamed not by China or India or ASEAN but by the countries who originated globalization in the first place. Level playing field is also a two-way traffic. When you open up markets through trade deals, through compact, through TPP, quote in quote, didn't happen, through APEC, through whatever forms of free trade agreements, whatever spaghetti, bo spaghetti bowls that you produce, somehow you don't only open markets you also open yourself up to a lot of other things that could be problematic to you later 
immigration is the obvious consequence of open trade. Investment back into your own countries are obvious. The spread of technology that they produce are being spread around the world. Intellectual property has become a problem. When you create a leveled playing field, you open up for a lot of other streams and exchanges that could be made possible because it is leveled. So, later on, uh, there is this anti-foreign goods, anti-immigration, anti anything that is alien only want to open up markets it's impossible once it is open it is open for all things good and bad in the ASEAN countries we realize this very well what did we realize what have we learned well when you integrate among yourselves you get the good sides of integration. You get the market, you get the resources, you get cheap labor for Thailand, and you get better trade with your neighbors, higher volume of trade with your neighbor, better connectivity. But then you are exposed to your neighbor's problems too. Diseases, sorry to say that, drugs, international crime, environmental degradation or impact of. And then you have all sorts, money laundering and everything else. But these are the things that you need to manage inside. You don't ask the collective to solve the problem for you. You manage your own problem inside so that you will be covered from the negative impact of integration. If you want to enjoy the positive sides of integration, fantastic, you have 620 million consumers a lot of them are middle class and rising. Purchasing power is rising. Fantastic. A volume of trade is expanding. Fantastic. But other things will come with integration. And that is something that Thailand has to learn. As an example, we are short of manual labor, this country. This city, Bangkok, needs foreign workers. A province like Samut Sakon or Mahachai where our fishing industry or our, our uh, processing plants for fishery products are located. Over half of the population are foreign. Ranong is the same. Phuket almost. I don't know about Mae Hong Son up north. I don't know about Jantaburi in the east. But this country has to make up its mind that it needs foreign workers. Manual. Because our young people don't want to go into that kind of employment anymore. They finish their colleges, they would go into digital and uh, this, what you call this, uh, electronic trade. Because it's easier. Because it takes less of your energy. You sit there and you start Googling. You start sending messages. You start s sending examples. You get orders. You make it easier for consumers, potential consumers, rather than having to make their trip to 
the shops or the supermarkets, they are here. And you will get it the next day if you ordered it today and at a better price and at a quality that is guaranteed. We need manual labor down there. Ask any construction business people. Ask food processing people. Ask agricultural people. Ask services people. If you go to Bamrung Rat today, that's immediate example because I just came out of the hospital. Messages on the message board are in Burmese, are in Bengali, are in Arabic, are in all the languages except Thai. Because they assume that those who walk into the doors of Bamrung Rat would be able to understand English anyway. I think they are right. Because the course is formidable for those who don't speak English. <laughs> you go to any restaurant on Soi Tong Law, you look at the board announcing vacancies inside. You will see the announcement in either English or Burmese. So the problems of integration are that you don't have all the good sides of, of, of integration. You will have the downside of, of integration and you have to manage it. And should I say that the management of the foreign labor market as exists is still in the dark, in the gray, and not very transparent. That's why we have problems. That's why a lot of them had to track to the border and some of them might not want to come back. And what do we do? Four years ago, there was a survey by UNHCR asking about the attitude of the ties particularly Bangkok ties, about foreign laborers. 90 plus percent said foreign laborers are nuisance, threat to national safety and security, and lives and property here in Bangkok. And those who were surveyed probably have a gardener from neighboring countries probably have housemaids from neighboring countries, probably have even drivers from neighboring countries. So that's an issue that a country like Thailand will have to make up our mind, that we can't have it both ways. If we need them, we need them, and we have to take good care of them, and we have to respect their human rights, and we have to make sure that their welfare and their rights are being protected. Otherwise, we will have problems with the rest of the world. And that problem comes in a very strange way. The U.S. said, human trafficking, you are tier two watch list. And many of us probably don't know that we got into that category because of the human trafficking that is taking place in this murky and gray and dark market of foreign labor market. We thought we were at the end of the line. We are not doing it. But we forgot to ask, how did you get here? Somebody you had to pay someone to get you across the border, to transport you to Bangkok, to be available to work for me. So, integration brings both. And that is a threat to further integration and further trade and further investment.
what happened, this is Crooksman, not me. He said, when the cost of transport is high, everybody enjoys manufacturing of some sort. Because manufacture here is probably cheaper. But when the cost is lower, there would be some people in the periphery who would feel squeezed because goods are being dumped on them because transport is cheap to deliver those goods. Finished. But when the cost is even lower, countries in the periphery would begin to see their own opportunities and consumers and producers in, he called the core countries, would begin to see the opportunity. We should move our factories out there, closer to the market, produce them cheaper in better quality sometimes, and we enjoy the cheaper products produced in the trillions out there and bring them back to us better than having to produce them ourselves. At some point, there will be this explosion of investment, of management manufacturing out there. What is being retained in the core countries? Technology. Research, innovation, science, design. And who have the possession of the knowledge of these things? Certainly not the working class in America, in the Midwest, in the Rust Belt. Certainly not the farmers in the UK. It is the people in London. It is the people in New York. It is the people in San Francisco. It is the people in probably Atlanta, Georgia, or Boston where they refuse to elect Mr. Trump because they were exposed to the world, because their interest is connected with the world, because the growth of globalization, they benefit. But when you talk to middle class, quote unquote, in the Rust Belt, Michigan, I, um, Ohio, Pennsylvania, you will see that they feel they are the losers. And the gap inside these countries, both in Europe and in the US, the gap's internal is getting wider and wider and wider. That's the frustration that became anti-globalization, that now, somehow, we have to manage and we have to live with. Trade has been growing. I have a small statistics here to confirm to you. I'll show my age. The value of merchandise trade and trade in commercial services in the year 2015 is nearly twice as high as the year 2005 in 10 years, twice. Because of this ease of transport, because of this, this opening up of markets, this liberal order, this level playing field, trade volume have grown up twice since 2005 to 2015. But then we have this problem in 2008, still continue to grow, but somehow it was dipped quite low in the year 2013, 2014. 15th went down pretty far. I think statistics shows from Trade volume 
was about 18, 19 trillion US dollars now, globally. It has gone down very, very steeply in the past two years. And the prediction for growth is this year is 2.5, 2.6 of global trade. But then we have to struggle against this anti-globalization, this designation of if you have a trade surplus with us, you are cheaters. Somehow we have to renegotiate the deals that we have with you. And this time it won't be multilateral, it will be bilateral. Because that's when we can squeeze more out of you than you can expect a concession from us. These things are, you can call it inequity, you can call it trade, you can call it unequal trade, and you can call it politics of foreign trade that have created a lot of problems for us and between us. I would say there is no other alternative except go back to multilateralism. I would say countries that think, who think that they have lost out in globalization with multilateralism have to think, rethink twice because the world has been opened up so that all of us would benefit rather than only one side benefit. And you want to go back to that world and that is not healthy for us. None of us. The immediately to us a geopolitical issue is of course the South China Sea. Out of 19, 18 trillion trade a year, 5.3 trillion of trade would have to go through this water which is called the South China Sea. And the management of that issue is something that will have a tremendous implication on the trade and the growth of trade and the growth of foreign direct investment here in this region. The US was out of the picture for a while because of the priorities in the Middle East. Mr. Obama came re-engagement with East Asia. By that time, the landscape has changed. There were other players onto the platform. And now is a tussle. And now we have somehow to go back to a semblance of balance that we need, stability that we need, security that we need, so that normal trade, 5.3.4 trillion US dollar trade that have to go in and out of this water space, territory, 4 million square kilometers that we have to address and help address. So there have been some attempts. Sometimes we have been dragged into it without knowing. The 
problem in the, the Korean Peninsula, problem in the South China Sea. All of a sudden, the Philippines, Thailand, rather than being cast away as non-democratic, becoming more important. It was a phone call from Washington inviting leaders of Singapore, Thailand, and the Philippines over. Promise our relationship will be at a greater height. If you don't read much into the message of that phone call, of those three phone calls, you probably won't think much about the implications. But if you think of Philippines as a treaty ally, Thailand as a treaty ally, and Singapore as a staging point or whatever you call, then you immediately see that East Asia, Southeast Asia are being divided for one camp or the other, for the potential problems that could happen. And then the treaty would be invoked and we can count on you to help handling the troubles and the problems that could happen in your part of the world. So geopolitics is always in the state of flux. It's always percolating somehow. It's always appearing or presenting itself in different ways more than just what meet the eyes. What do we do to make sure that our regional interests, collective interests, continues to be served against this anti-globalization, against this anti-multilateralism, I would say more of regional coordination and cooperation among us. Because without closer consultation and coordination among us, now it's not only ASEAN, but ASEAN plus six, RCEP, ASEAN Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. ASEAN plus China, Japan, Korea, plus India, Australia, New Zealand. This would represent, geographically anyway, the largest trading block, if we can make it. But I see this is the only alternative to manage ourselves and our interests here in Southeast Asia, in East Asia. More of regional integration and cooperation and coordination than less. Because we have to stand against those pressures coming from outside. Henry Kissinger once said, East Asia, as far as trade, investment, science, technology, and innovation, he said. He said this at the end of last century. East Asia is equivalent to 20th century Europe at that time. But he said, as far as institutions, systems, and organizations, to address the problems potentially could open up among them and between them, and there are so many flashpoints, so many areas of potential conflicts. He said East Asia is still 19th century Europe, the balance of power. You can't expect China and Japan to work together for that system, that institution, that process and organization. So that 
we can manage problems among us. You can't expect Japan and Korea to work together. You can't expect China and India to work together. One state of India is still being claimed by China. You can't expect Australia, New Zealand to work with because there is no legitimate region-wide platform for it. The only one that is legitimate with convening power is the one we have here in Southeast Asia called ASEAN. It just so happened that the small and medium-sized countries got together, threatening none, welcoming all, have been trusted with this responsibility of creating a system, a process, institutions, so that we can manage the potential problems among us and between us. So that trade can go on, foreign investment can grow, and all other exchanges can even further be promoted. So somehow it falls on the lap of ASEAN to do this heavy lifting. Again, because we have that convening power. The challenge for us is to make our own region more integrated and effective, more cohesive among ourselves, and with one voice. And the irony is ASEAN has come to this part, to this point in our history, 50th anniversary this year, not because of democratic leadership, because of authoritarian leadership, the like of Lee Kuan Yew, the like of Suharto, the like of Marcos, the like of Mahathir, the like of Prem in this country for eight years. So if we want to really make ASEAN effective, people-oriented, delivering what it promises to deliver, there's no other choice but going back to the people, bringing the people on this journey and open up the space for them so that they can identify it for themselves that their future, the future of their children, their posterity is connected with the growth and the development and the evolution of this region, this platform in its next second half of century after the 8th of August. We will enter our second half of the century. So we need people to get involved. We need people who trust. We need leaders who trust people. We need leaders who have visions. We have leaders who have the ability to communicate and bring their people along on this journey. To your disappointment, to my sadness, ASEAN has never been an issue in any election in ASEAN. It's a sideline. It's something left unsaid because we are dealing with problems inside. Well, unless and until people identify their own future with this organization, then we can't expect the organization, the region, the integration of the region to deliver and to help us against all these pressures and threats from outside in the form of anti-globalization, 
in the form of anti-multilateralism, in the form of anti-all trades and goods and services that somehow the other side benefit and we lose. We refu they refuse to see the logic of it, that it has to be a two-way traffic for us in East Asia, Southeast Asia, to live through these troubled waters in the next several years. There's more need for ASEAN and for ASEP and for better cooperation and coordination among us effectively, committedly, and passionately going forward together. Otherwise, we would, we would be the victims of all these threats and challenges to our own prosperity that we have built this far. We have benefited this much, but it will be under threat if we don't cooperate and coordinate together and make this platform really a platform that delivers what it was meant to deliver. Good luck and thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Sareen. Please remain on stage. Um, may I invite Kun Gersada Pyeongpongsan to please come on stage and present Dr. Sareen with a token of appreciation. Thank <laughs> you. I think he knows the answers, just want to ask. <laughs> uh, essentially, uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to attend this seminar. In the morning, uh, we have Dr. Superchai, and in the afternoon, uh, you are here. So it bring back a vivid memory of Ang Tat Ten that uh, Thailand hosted in the year 2000. So I share a few with your excellency about the outcome of the Ang Tat Ten conference. Certainly, we address the question of globalization after three years of uh, financial crisis. And this year, we are to commemorate anniversary, 20th anniversary of Asian financial crisis. Of course, the trade negotiation had been stalled uh, before the year 2000, we are not able to embark on the new uh, trade negotiation round because of the anti-globalization <laughs> movement. Just uh, two weeks ago at the G20 meeting, you see a lot of protests about the financial system of the world which has not been in shape after we have discussed this very important uh, issue at the Ang Tat Ten conference, and certainly with Bangkok Declaration and also Plan of Action, I just like to bring your Excellency and everyone that uh, Ang Tat uh, have been doing. Uh, you know, I don't know how how much progress that been implemented. This morning, if I have time, I will ask Dr. Superchai. He has been the uh, DG of the WTO for five years or three years, and. Uh, 10 years at section of Ang Tat. So I just asked your Excellency to share with us a bit about the present state of the world environment uh, in terms of, you know, you mentioned about uh, the multilateralism is dying. I, it's under threat. Yeah, under threat. Yeah. This morning, I'd like to ask Dr. Tubachai if the WTO is still alive and well, <laughs> or we are going for <coughs> regionalism and do essentially mention about you know, uh, this uh, very important issue. So I just like to thank you. Ask thank you, you to share with this. Thank you, Your Excellency. I I remember campaigning for Dr. Superchai to become the Director General of the WTO back in the year 1998-2000. Uh, it was a very very long 
tedious and exhaustive campaign. Uh, but then we got it at the end. It was a phone call from Washington to the foreign minister of Thailand saying the president is getting worried that our bilateral relations are being affected because of Super Chai and Mike Moore. You remember? Of New Zealand. The U.S. was for Mike Moore. And many of us in the developing countries said it has to be the first director general for Ang Tat. After all, it was created as a platform of negotiation for developing countries, emerging countries. So we were at a locker head and the phone call came. President is worried about our relations. We should bring this to an end. And if they can't decide, to hell with both of them. That was the language on the phone to the foreign minister of Thailand. I said, what do you mean to hell with both of them? Well, we are ready to go for a third candidate. Not Super Chai, not Roko Pero. Uh, not Super Chai, not Mike Moore. I was stunned with that ultimatum. We have worked for over two years to get Dr. Super Chai to the WTO. If he were here, he would testify to this. And uh, I was quiet for a few seconds. I said, Madam Secretary, now you know who called me. <laughs> I said, and I told her, I told her in many places, and she just smiled. She just laughed at it. I said, Madam Secretary, your third candidate is not going to solve any problem. Why not? Well, because he or she would become the symbol of the failure of this process, the divisiveness of this process, and the bitterness that we have created. He or she is not going to accomplish anything that you want. I was on the phone. <laughs> this time she was silent for a while <laughs> and asked, so what are we going to do? <laughs> That's when the idea of split decision came. Because I listened and I read as uh, what you call the uh, manager of that campaign, according to the cabinet, foreign minister must, camp, must be the coordinator of this campaign. I said, well, sometime in March, this was about June when she called, I said, sometime in March, at the end of the general council in Geneva, talking about this issue, there was a very feeble voice behind, at the very end, that Mr. Chairman, why don't we have both of them, four years each? And then the whole thing was closed. But it was recorded by the representative from Bangladesh by the name of Kaduri, I believe. And I said, why don't we resurrect that proposal? I don't know if this is possible. I don't have lawyers. You have a lot of lawyers, both in Geneva and in Washington. Ask your boys to look into the rules and the regulation of the Libito, whether you can have two in, with one decision, but not four, four. 4-4 would be unfair to other parts of the world who also would want to be on, in that position. Why don't we have it 3-3? <laughs> and she said, okay, give me a few hours. I'll come back to you. The next evening, there was that phone call again, this time from the plane, flying from Paris to Helsinki. Why? Because she had to report to the president of Finland about the negotiations on Kosovo. But it was what you call, it was direct, uh, what you would call, it was done through communication center in Washington, D.C. The secretary wants to talk to you. I said, well, you know, it's, it's late. Uh, I have to get ready for work tomorrow. Can it be done? Can we talk tomorrow? No, she wants to talk to you now. Fine, put her on. 
And she said, Surin, what we talked about last night is doable. Doable. Three years each. Take both. <laughs> but with this caveat. And you don't know, I haven't told anybody this. She said, but Mike Moore has to come first. <laughs> I said, Madam Secretary, two phone calls between Washington and Bangkok, and we decide on this thing. And they in Geneva have been stuck on this issue for the last 18 months. How do you think they are going to react? They can turn the table over to hell with you. We've been working on this for a year and a half, and you made two phone calls and you agreed. Even who would come first? I said, well, you know, let Geneva be part of the decision, not you and me. But just let them talk and let them feel the ownership of it. Kun Krai Jirapad was our representative at the WTO. Kun Krit, not this one, but Krit Kanjana Kun Chon, our ambassador to the, the UN in Washington, in uh, Geneva. That's how that idea came to a split decision. Of course, on our side, we already made up our mind. First or second doesn't really matter as long as we get it. And we, what you call, justify to ourselves, maybe the first three years, Mike Moore will finish everything, Super Chai come in on the th fourth year, and he would deliver. <laughs> Both of them deliver nothing <laughs> because of that problem that uh, the ambassador was talking about. Anyway, but that was a great campaign. <laughs> it's a campaign that somehow we could split Australia from New Zealand. You know, Australia and New Zealand always go places together. One pact, one agreement, Australia and New Zealand. Because they are this un ansas, fraternity, British commonwealth. So, uh, so we split Australia from New Zealand. Australia became our, one of our cheerleaders. Mr. If you recall, uh, Tim Fisher, Minister of Trade, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Deputy Prime Minister under Howard. So we split Australia from New Zealand, but somehow we got India and Pakistan to support the same candidate, Supachai. That's also a big accomplishment because India and Pakistan never agree on anything. But somehow we got them to agree to Supachai. And without the support, particularly Japan. Japan said, we will be with Super Chai until the end of the world. <laughs> Your meeting minister. I said, with that commitment, we can't fail. Because if we don't get it, they don't get it. Because it has to be a consensus. When Japan said, we'll be with you until the end of the world, fantastic. We will use that as our bargaining point. Well, Ambassador Grid. Things have changed since then. That, as I said, multilateralism somehow has not been working well, and WTO has lost its clout. Not only WTO, the UN has lost its clout. And the UN system is suffering from lack of fun, lack of. Current Secretary General is one of the best international civil servants that you could find. I just wish him well. I work with him at UNHCR and know how well, how effective, how persuasive he is. I just wish that the international multilateral system can be resuscitated back to the benefit of all of us. I'm just not quite sure. And for those who come from the West, it reminds me of this poem by William Butler Yeats when he said things fall apart the center cannot hold he said the worst are full of passionate conviction but the best among us lacked all capacity and will 
I hope that those who are in this room are the best that would not lose your hope, your capacity to bring back the good side of the global community of multilateralism of multi-trade agreements of norms and rules and regulations transparent dishing out as fair as possible to all the players and the stakeholders of the world rather than winners take all rather than the strong dictate the outcome of any deal of any negotiation that will not be a pleasant world for us and certainly for the future of our children so I wish you would be that best in that category of William Butler Yeats that you will be full of conviction to bring the best out of all of us for the benefit of all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And once again, may I invite Queen Krisada to come please back. come on stage. Now Queen Krisada can come back. <laughs> <laughs>